everybody. Hi, oh hi, how are you? Wow. Thank you, thank you for that very generous and loving uh, welcome. Thank you, Laura. Laura's a real, she's a traveling angel. I mean, anywhere, it's kind of like the political equivalent of a groupie, right? I mean, but uh, way more angelic than groupie-like, and thank you, thank you. I, uh, I can't see uh, very well because of the light to see. Sure. But I think that uh, it is uh, probably true that some old friends of mine are in this room. Yeah. So whether you are someone I've known for many years or whether uh, I've never actually uh, personally met you before, please know how grateful I am that you are here. And uh, as you probably heard, I'm running for president of the United States again. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love about California. Uh, uh, I, I know most of you are aware that I have a lot of background with both uh, Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. Uh, so this is my area of the world, uh, my soul's base. And uh, my career as an author and a lecturer certainly was born here. And the sensibility um, that gave rise uh, to that career, I'm aware could not have happened anywhere, uh, really, but California. And one of the things is that in California, when you want to do something different, people are like, ooh, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in a lot of other parts of the country and of the world, it's like, <laughs> what? Uh, we don't do it that way, and who let you in? Um, but in California, it's like, oh, I did. Um, what do you think? Remember that line in um, uh, Legally Blonde? What, you think you can just go to Harvard? And she said, what, it's hard? Uh, I feel that a little bit about what you think you can just run for president. What, it's hard? Um, and it is hard, but uh, not in the ways uh, that those people would have even, even thought. So the same sensibility. I know when I first ran for president, some people uh, who come from the metaphysical and higher consciousness field were kind of like, what is she doing? She went somewhere else. And nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the same principles of metaphysics, higher consciousness, and spirituality, and personal growth that I have been involved with, not only in my own life as a, as a person living and as a, a seeker, as a student of these things, but also as a teacher and a writer and so forth. They apply to the collective every bit as much as they apply to the individual. And that is because all that a nation is, all that a collection of people is, is a group of individuals. So if an individual has to clean up the past in order to have the future you want, so does a group. If an individual has to be clear about what is your purpose here? What is your mission statement? What is, who are you? What are you doing here? That is as true of a nation as it is true of an individual. And just as a, an individual is subject to the laws of the universe, i.e., whatever you put out does come back to you, that is as true for a collection of people as well. Now, when it comes to our personal lives, uh, Americans tend to be, not just in California, but at this point pretty much everywhere, um, very aware of what is going on inside our own head and our own life. I'm sure that not just, this is the point, not just in Ojai, but in almost anywhere in this country. You could take any two people in a group and say, okay, you're gonna go to dinner after, and within 30 minutes, everybody would know who's in therapy, who's in a toxic relationship, who has to set boundaries, um, and who is just getting over their trauma. Um, it's kind of what we do. And uh, there's the shadow, almost ridiculous side of over-pathologizing, but there's also the serious work of understanding what's going on here. But it's very interesting, because even though when it comes to our own individual psychological development, we do at least try to get deep and get real, when it comes to our role as citizens and the collective, we've been trained uh, to think like sixth graders. We've been trained to farm out our best thinking, our own critical thoughts and discernment. We've been trained quite simply to dumb it down. Now, that is completely contrary to the whole point of this country. 
Thomas Jefferson said that the only safe repository for power is in the hands of the people. Yes. Now that's, that was radical back then, and it is radical now. Because if the power is in the hands of the people, the, the notion there, as I said, is very radical. It's the idea, not that we have ever fully manifested, none of us are stupid. I'm not saying we've fully manifested this for anyone. I'm not saying we've fully actualized it, although we have come a, lo a long way since the founding of this country. But the idea is, the ideal, once again, is that no matter who you are, no matter whether you're rich or you're poor, black, white, brown, gay, straight, non-binary, no matter what your religion, no matter what your ethnicity, theoretically, so the ideal goes, if you have public education, so that you have the critical thought processes necessary, as Jefferson said, to govern a great nation. You have a free press so that we can be sure you really know what's going on, also brings up a lot. And you have freedom of assembly, such as you have right here, right now, so that we can talk to each other and try to figure things out. The idea is that if we do those things, if we protect that space, and then you elect people who will represent you that America more than not would do okay. Now that, it's not that the founder said, oh, every decision we're gonna make is gonna be right, but that more than not, that's how we will come up with the right answers for our collective selves. Now, when that works, we've, things have been pretty wonderful. And my experience, uh, right, well, first of all, my experience even in my career, uh, metaphysically as an author and all of that, but in addition to that, my experience in politics has made me ever more uh, convinced uh, that as a people, we're fine, thank you. Uh, the problem is not the American people. Uh, I think we're as decent and as intelligent and as noble when we are called to be noble as are the people anywhere in the world. We're not better than other people, but I think that we, we, we can rise to the occasion when called to as much as anyone. So the problem is not that theory that if you give it to the American people and their will is expressed, we'll be okay. I believe in that now as much as, as, as possible. The problem, however, is that the conduit for the expression of our will namely the American political system, instead of working to channel the better angels of our nature, instead of working to channel the expressed will that we put into the world with voting and so forth, and even instead of serving what should be its highest goal, which is the, to secure our inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which would be our safety and well-being and health. Instead, that political machinery, it's as though it has been hacked. And it actually mitigates against the fullest expression of our will. So the problem is not the people. The problem is a political system that now sits on top of the will of the people and in far too many cases actually works against it. Now, it having been thus hacked, <laughs> it having been thus corrupted, many of us have said for a long time, that's one toxic pool of shit. I don't want anything to do with it. I want to live my life away from it. It's irrelevant. But how relevant is it really if that is the space where the decisions are made regarding whether or not there are carcinogens in your food? where the decisions are not whether or not your air is safe to breathe, where the decisions are made whether or not your water is safe to drink, whether or not your streets are safe, whether or not your children are well cared for, and whether or not people die not only here but in other parts of the world based on policies that are paid for by your tax dollars. So I think a lot of people, in fact, I think a critical mass of people realize now that we can't afford to not go there. But I've run for president now, so having run this time, 
I have to tell you, I don't have to tell you, but I want to tell you. <laughs> as bad as you think it might be, it's worse. Yeah. We have a real problem. But I think that in our collective life, just like in our personal lives, when we have to figure something out, when we need to deeply analyze, I think that's where a lot of people are right now. You know, a lot of people think Americans are complacent and Americans are apathetic. I don't think so. I think we're all just like, wait, I got to think about this. You know, we're all kind of like just processing what's happening. I don't think people can even believe that it's gotten as bad as it's got. So I think we're all just sort of trying to figure this out, knowing that there are a lot of factors and forces in this country which mitigate against our clearly thinking things out. So let's apply the same principles of discernment that we would apply in our individual lives. And a lot of that has to do with, let's go back to the beginning. Just like when you go to therapy and you learn about your family and you learn about your parents, you learn about your grandparents, you learn about your own childhood, and when you understand the past more, you're more empowered, not only in terms of understanding your present, but also in understanding how you can most consciously navigate your future. So I'd like to go back uh, to 1776. So in 1776, a document was signed by 56 very brave men. And I say that they were very brave because if the British had won the war, they would have all been executed as traitors, uh, treasonous uh, to the King of England. And with their signing that document, they infused into the founding of a nation principles more enlightened than had ever, ever formed the founding of a country. And that document would change the world. It was a complete repudiation of a very concept of how groups of people should operate, particularly in connection with their government. It was a repudiation of systems that had been pla in place for centuries and longer. And there were simple, yet powerful, and radical principles that they laid down. Number one, that all men are created equal. Once again, I remember being a child, and I remember learning about the divine right of kings. Remember, the sun god, that God gave power to the king, to the queen, to their rich friends, cronies called the aristocrats, and it was simply understood that they were the ones who were entitled. They were entitled to the land, they were entitled to the wealth, they were entitled to wealth creation and opportunity. And everybody else lived on some level in service to them. All men, it said, were created equal. Created equal created, that indicates there is a creator, given by their creator, inalienable, can't take it away from them, rights of life, of liberty, and of the pursuit of happiness. And then it gets even more radical. It says that the reason governments are instituted is in order to secure those rights, not thwart those rights, not diminish those rights, not undercut those rights, to secure those rights. And then most radical of all, I think, if the government is not doing its job, it's the right of the people to alter it or to abolish it. Now, you know, in Judaism it said that every generation must rediscover God for itself. And I think that same principle applies here. Every generation of Americans needs to take in those principles. They are our North Star. That document is our mission statement. Abraham Lincoln said it was the basis of the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln said it is an eternal rebuke. He said the Declaration of Independence is an eternal rebuke against all forms of tyranny and oppression. And you're kidding yourself if you think tyranny and oppression do not exist in the United States. Now, if we put those principles on marble walls somewhere or have them written on parchment and they're under glass, they're not necessarily connected to the heart. And if we have too many generations that go by without any real emotional or psychological or visceral connection to those principles, then we become easy to play. And we have been played. And we've all been played at various times in our lives, and at a certain point you wake up. I was a fool then, I'm not a fool now, and I'm not going to take it anymore. And that's where we need to be. 
But let's understand exactly what happened when the Declaration of Independence was signed. As I said, 56 men signed it, but get this, 41 of them were slave owners. So wait a minute, what's going on here? That means that even though the document lays down the ideal of a society in which, to the best of our ability, it can work for anyone, even at the beginning, 41 out of the 56 didn't really mean it. <laughs> now, what that means is that we're both and. That's our DNA. We've always been, in every generation, including ours, both and. It's a kind of bipolarity in the, in the American consciousness. We are, in every generation, two things. One, people whose, whose hearts are just ablaze with this possibility of what it means. It doesn't just mean you can have whatever you want. It means anybody can. It doesn't just mean you can manifest and actualize. It means anybody can. It means the idea of a society created in which if anybody does the work to make it happen, they should be able to. Yeah, yeah. And that government should support them in that. Like, whoa. <laughs> then there are people who have struggled for that, who have sacrificed for that. There are people who have died for that. And then within every generation, started at the beginning, there were those who said that for their either ideological and or financial purposes, that really won't work. And who have proven in the most atrocious ways, and even today do so, that they will do whatever it takes. I mean, whatever it takes to make sure that in places where those ideals would challenge their bottom line, then those ideals shall not come to pass. And I point that out because I think in order for us to be most empowered in this moment, we need to see that what we're going through is nothing new. From the beginning, there were those who put their property rights before your life. That's really all we're talking about here. Now, then you look at the arc of American history. How did those who are willing to struggle, are willing to sacrifice for those ideals, how did they respond to the forces which mitigate against them? Well, pretty well. Our ancestors responded to slavery with abolition. And our ancestors rose up and responded to the institutionalized oppression of women with the suffragist movement and the passage of the 19th Amendment. Our ancestors rose up against the financial inequities of the Gilded Age with the establishment of organized labor. And our ancestors rose up against segregation and the institutionalized oppression of black people in the American South with the civil rights movement. And I have and I am running for president of the United States because it's our turn now. <clears throat> But in our time, it's not a specific institutional reality that is the mode of oppression. It is an entire economic paradigm. It is the very idea that short-term profit maximization for huge corporations, namely a matrix of them, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, big food companies, big agricultural companies, big chemical companies, big gun manufacturers, big oil companies, and defense contractors, that for some reason our governing principles should be their financial good. The idea that the stockholder class of these huge corporate entities, that short-term profits for them should come before the safety, the health, and the well-being of the American people. Which means that when Abraham Lincoln stood on the battlefield at Gettysburg. And that battlefield was particularly significant because once the North won that battle, that was it, that we knew the Union was going to be saved. That was that decisive. And so he came there. And he wrote, of course, the, obviously, the legendary, the famous Gettysburg Address. And in referring to the men who had died for the North there, he said that they had given their last full measure of devotion so that a government of the people 
and by the people and for the people would not perish from this earth. Ladies and gentlemen and everyone else, it's perishing now. And it's perishing on our watch. We have transitioned from a government of the people, by the people, and for the people to a government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. <laughs> now, it even gets worse. The political parties are one of the corporations. I used to think, oh, no, 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 they chop water and carry wood, you know, they chop wood and carry water, I mean, for these corporations. It's worse than that. They are part of the corporate matrix. The Democratic Party is itself a huge business interest. And there is a political media industrial complex. And so they know what they want. They know their agenda. And they have no intention of letting anyone even into the conversation who would drive this car in a different direction. Because their service is to enable those corporations. And that is because, particularly since Citizens United 14 years ago, that Supreme Court decision, those corporations now have unlimited power to influence the direction of our political elections. So these tentacles, these tentacles that come out from this, this strain, this malevolent strain of unfettered, soulless capitalism now goes into every single corner of our society. It affects your health, it affects your food, it affects your communities, it affects your environment. There's nothing it doesn't affect anymore to the point where it even has so affected and influenced and held hostage Washington, D.C. itself that Washington itself is a system of legalized bribery. Now remember, Political parties aren't even mentioned in the Constitution. And George Washington told us in his farewell address, he warned us against them. He said he feared they would become factions of men who were more loyal to their parties than to their country. And John Adams, the second president, said he saw them as the greatest threat to our democracy. And so now they have... Um, considered themselves and do consider themselves entitled to curate, curate your choices. And they use money to make sure that no one that they would consider riffraff has a way to really get in. So the problem is not that we don't have solutions to the problems in our midst. We do, America doesn't lack geniuses, America doesn't lack best practices. I'm sure all around here, there are all kinds of environmental projects, regenerative agriculture. Americans know what to do to fix everything that has been broken. But this is the problem. The people with solutions are over here and the people with power over there. And too often the people with the solutions don't have any real power. And the real with the power don't really want to hear from those who have solutions because those who have solutions, the solution itself would undercut the bottom line profit maximization of those corporate entities which empower with their donations those with the power. So you've got people with solutions, let's have a fundraiser, and we're gonna try to raise $25,000 or $50,000 or $100,000. Meanwhile, the people with power are giving millions and even billions of dollars in corporate subsidies to the people who are causing the problems that these people are trying to solve. And there's only one way now, there's only one way now for this to change, because this has been going on at high, high velocity for 50 years, to the point that we have completely destroyed America's uh, middle class. In the 1970s, when I first lived here, when I was in college, and I know for those of you who are young, now for those of you who are older, you're gonna, uh-huh, for those of you who are young, you, you probably intellectually know that what I'm telling, is, telling you is true, but you know, part of you is like, no, fairy tale, right? No, it's not a fairy tale. I'm gonna to describe to you a land long ago and far away, the 1970s. The average American couple could afford a house. The average American couple could afford a car. The average American couple could afford a yearly vacation. The average American couple could afford, should they choose, for one parent to stay home and be with the children. The average American couple, one salary, supported a family of four. And that couple could afford to send their kids to college. 
and there were tuition-free college systems all over this country, University of California being prime among them, University of Texas, University of Florida. But over the last 50 years, there's been a massive transfer of wealth to the tune of $50 trillion from the 90% of Americans to 1% of Americans. And this was achieved through this idea you know, of trickle-down economics, the idea that if you just try to increase money for the stockholding class, that'll be good, see, because they'll become job creators, and all that money will trickle down and lift all boats. Well, their business model has never been job creation. It's job elimination. It's worker exploitation. It's money for the stockholders at the expense of the good of all the other stakeholders, like workers, like community, like environments. It's slashing taxes for the very, very richest. It's giving huge multi-billion dollar subsidies to industries that are already making billions of dollars in profit. It's demonizing and suppressing unions. And it's giving all the money possible to a very few at the expense of the many. This is not going to stop of itself. The word inertia means the tendency of the object to move in whatever direction it's moving. So at this point, that is the status quo. That's the way things work. And one major political party says, yeah, what of it? And the other major political party has figured out what you want to hear. The other major political party has these two basic elements, those who are basically down with the whole corporatist agenda and those who are progressives. But when I was growing up, the progressives had spine. And today, it's like they're standing in line and making sure that the establishment within the party likes them so that maybe they could run in 32 or 36. At this point, there's only one thing that's going to save us, and that is we the people. The system itself, the status quo itself, will not disrupt itself. That's our job. And there's only one way that that can get done, and that is through a peaceful revolution and march at the ballot box, unlike anything we have ever seen in this country. <clears throat> now, when you think of what the abolitionists did, and you think of what the women suffragists did, and you think of what those early labor organizers did, and you think of what the civil rights movement did, and we really have to ask ourselves, you know, we, we know we have to look at the problems in our past, but I think we really have to look at the problem solvers in our past. What aspect of us needs to rise up now? In this, just as I used to say in my lectures, you know, Courts and Miracles and stuff, I would say the era of data collection is over. We've all read the same books. We've all listened to the same tapes. Many of us have written them. At this point, it's time for that next step. And that next step is application of these ideas. And when it comes to politics, that comes with necessary courage. I could tell you all the stats, and most of you you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that I might mention some statistics you don't know specifically, but none of this is stuff you don't already know. 70% of Americans say that they live with chronic economic anxiety. 39% of Americans now. 39% of Americans report that they regularly skip meals in order to pay their rent. Over half of our bankruptcies are due to medical debt, and one in four Americans live with medical debt. 68,000 Americans die every year from lack of health care. 1.3 million Americans are rationing their insulin. 75 to 90 percent of Americans are either uninsured or underinsured. Millions of Americans work at jobs that they hate just so that they can get those benefits. How many jobs do people have to work where one isn't enough? How many people have to work at two jobs or three jobs? How many couples have to work, each of them, at more than one job? And then we expect them to really be emotionally present for each other at the end of the evening, for their children, much less for their community. People are weighed down now. People are dumbed down now. People have like had it. People are exhausted. And that's the plan. Maybe not conscious, but that is definitely how things are going right now. So as I said, the only way that this is going to change is if we the people decide to change it. And I decided to run for president because I'm a we the people. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, I've been treated, uh, who let you in here? So I'd like you to know who let me in. James frickin' Madison let me in here. James Madison let me in, and he got some help from Susan B. Anthony. And that's very important to realize. Because the Constitution says that the 
qualifications for being president are that you have to have been born here, you have to be 35 years or older, and you have to have lived here for 14 years. Now, in this as in many things, it's as significant what the founders didn't say as what they did say. They didn't say you have to have been a lawyer. They didn't say you had to have been a governor. They didn't say you had to have been a senator. They didn't say you have to have been a congressman. They didn't want a political class. The whole point was to not have one. And so they left that out. It's whoever you want, because they were leaving it to every generation to determine for yourself. What do you think is the skill set necessary in order to best answer to the challenges of our time. Many of you have known me, probably a lot of you have known me for years. We've uh, been around this area. This is where it all began for me. And when I first uh, began lecturing in Los Angeles, very shortly afterwards, the AIDS crisis burst onto the scene. So for me and my career from the very beginning, you couldn't do this work separate from a lot of human suffering. And so I feel that I've been very blessed and, and really it's been a privilege to be invited into people's lives at some of their darkest hours. But when my career began in the 1980s, whether it was people with AIDS, whether it was people who had been diagnosed with some other illness that was critical and life challenging, whether it was someone who had lost a loved one, uh, whether it was someone who had uh, gone bankrupt, whether it was someone who found out that their child was, uh, was on heroin and they had no idea. The experiences that I had during those years were that the crisis which occurred was the exception and not the rule. And it seemed to me that it, it, in America at that time, we were still a country that had crises, but the crisis was the exception, not the rule. When I moved to Detroit at the end of the, about 1998, what I began to see in the ensuing years, and not just there but all over, was how many people I met for whom the crisis they were dealing with was the rule and not the exception. And I began to realize that we become a country in permanent crisis. It's not just the environment, it's a crisis of the environment, it's a crisis of democracy, it's a crisis of the economy, it's always a crisis because we're living in a state of permanent crisis because the system itself has become a crisis. And what I began to realize in dealing with so many people that this was not just a crisis such as illness or uh, that was simply nothing that could be uh, you know, that, that it, it happened and really it's nobody's fault that it happened, I began to realize how many people were living in a permanent state of crises, at least indirectly because of bad public policy. It wasn't just that they got sick, it was that they didn't have health care. I began to be people living in a rolling state of emergency. You know, there's a screaming emergency, and then there's a, what's called a silent emergency. You know, when the COVID emergency, when President Biden said, go back to your lives, Go back to your lives, the emergency is over. For many people, the lives that they went back to was another form of emergency they had been living with before. Not having health care when you're really sick is an emergency. Not having access to insulin when you are diabetic is an emergency. Being able, not being able to support your family. Once again, please take this in, 39% of Americans, 39% of Americans now report that they regularly skip their meals. Regularly skip meals in order to pay their rent. I, I'm shocked and I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room who has noticed this. You meet people now who make a decent living. You know, they have a nice job, they have the kind of job that we grew up to think, well, that's the kind of job where, you know, you're okay, you're making it. We have one third of America's workers living on less than $15 an hour and half of them unable to find a place to rent. Half of America's renters can't afford it. And I have met people that were not people I would have expected to hear this from. They are professionals, they do good work, they have good jobs, who will say things to me like, I can't afford my groceries. I can't, I can't afford what I mean, I'm, I'm having a hard time making sure I get, you know, I want my kids to have the fruits and the vegetables. We, I can't get every week what I think of as the healthy food for my children. And so I, in running for president, have really seen, and I've seen more this time even than last time, how resistant the system is to the kinds of things that you and I might say, well, we should do it that way. And my, well, we should do it that way, while considered kind of far left or out there or crazy, unserious, fringe, that's called psyops. That is considered that way, although everything I'm about to mention to you that I think is, this is what we ought to do are considered moderate positions in every other advanced democracy. 
We should have what Franklin Roosevelt called a, an economic bill of rights. We should have universal health care. We should have tuition-free college and tech school, which not only they have in every other advanced democracy, but which a majority of Republicans as well as Democrats say they want. We should have a complete elimination of the college loan debt because it should never have even been there. We should have subsidized child care. We should have paid family leave. We should have a guaranteed living wage. We have not raised the minimum wage since 2009. It's $7.25 an hour. And in every major city in the United States, it's over $20 an hour. We should have a guaranteed living wage, and we should have guaranteed affordable housing, and we should have guaranteed sick pay. We should also have a Department of Peace, because we need to be as sophisticated in our ability and willingness to, to wage peace as to wage war, which God knows we do way too often in order to increase profits for defense contractors rather than to express any righteous sense of foreign policy in this country. We should have peace games, not just war games. We should have armies of peace builders, not just armies armies of military personnel. We should have a peace academy, not just a military academy. And we should go further. We should have a Department of Children and Youth because of the extraordinary risk to so many millions of American children. We have millions of American children who go to schools and places where they don't even have the adequate ability to teach a child to read. And if that child cannot learn to read by the age of 10, the chances of high school graduation are drastically reduced, and the chances of incarceration are drastically increased. The next thing we should do is to end America's war on drugs. It was initiated in 1971 by Richard Nixon, who knew that it had nothing to do with being public enemy number one. It was in large part an attack on black communities. When I was in college here, in Pomona, in Claremont, there were 300,000 people in prison in the United States. Today, there are 2.3 million, and almost half of our federal prisoners are nonviolent drug offenders. Black Americans and white Americans take drugs at roughly the same rate. However, you don't have a bunch of policemen raiding white neighborhoods to find out if there are any drugs around here. And as we all know, when it comes to drugs, as well as to every other criminal offense, black people are likely to be given roughly 20% longer sentence than is, uh, is a white person who's convicted for the same crime. So if you want to start dismantling the prison industrial complex, starting to decriminalize drugs is one of the ways we do this. This will also be very helpful at the southern border because it will undercut the black market of the drug cartels. And this also gives us more bandwidth to go after the drug that we really do need to be seriously concerned with, obviously, and that is fentanyl. So these are the kinds of things we need to do. We need to obviously ramp down, not ramp up, fossil fuel extraction. We're living in an age where I don't care if they're Democrat or Republican, those presidents line up with big oil and they line up with the military industrial complex. Except, like I said, what the establishment corporates as Democrats have done is have figured out what you want to hear. So they'll say, I'm the climate president, and they'll put, out, put some very healthy investments in green energy in the Inflation Reduction Act. Yay, and, that, and I mean that yay very seriously, actually, they're great. However, it's a classic purse thief distraction technique. Maybe if you look at that, you won't realize that while we're investing in green energy, we're investing even more in dirty energy. So that President Biden, for instance, is given more oil drilling permits than even Trump did, plus he has okayed the Willow Project, which I would cancel on day one. What is it? What's going on here? We have actually progressive, supposedly progressive environmental organizations who have endorsed Biden. We have a lot of progressives who have endorsed Biden. Why is that? You know, I remember Barbara Ehrenreich wrote an article many years ago, and she said, what has happened to the left in America? What has happened to the real progressives in America? And she said, oh, I understand. We've all been invited to the White House at least once. They get sucked in. They get their phone calls returned by the, some middling manager at the White House who will say things to them like, you know we agree with you. You know, we're, we, you know we agree with you. Just wait till the second term and we'll get it done. Or you know we agree with you, but you know it's the Republicans who won't let us do it. There's always an excuse. And there's always an excuse because there is no deep down intention for fundamental economic or military reform. So what's happening now, we all know that uh, President Eisenhower, of course, his famous farewell address talking about the military industrial complex, it rules the day no matter whether it's a Republican or a D Democratic president at this point. The last thing I read, we were already going, oh my God, the yearly budget is almost a billion, it's almost, you know, it's almost a billion dollars, it's almost a billion dollars. 
Oh, that's like nothing. Now, 1.5 trillion dollars is what they were talking about now. So we're at a point now where if we were to say we are going to actually fundamentally reform this system, that is such a challenge to the system as it is now that it will take nothing less than a deep characterological shift inside ourselves. You know, uh, Martin Luther King said we need external changes in our circumstances and we need internal qualitative changes in our souls. In politics as well as everything else, the date era of data collection is over. I haven't told you guys anything you don't already know. I mean, maybe I told you a statistic or two you don't know, but we all know. We're living at a moment of, of I believe, great possibility because we live at a moment, a, a critical mass is, is possible here. One of the reasons a critical mass is, uh, is possible here is because people on the right as well as people on the left are starting to figure out that the real problem is not those to your left, the real problem is not those to your right, it's one of those don't look up things. The real dichotomy is the powerless versus the, uh, the powerful versus the powerless. The real dichotomy is between those who have access to capital and increased and increasing cap access to capital versus those who are just struggling to get by. So if we're in the top 20% of earners in the United States, this is, this is great and this is to be celebrated. But 20%? That means you have no middle class. If only 20% of Americans consider themselves, I have easy enough access to health care. I have easy enough access to higher education. I have easy enough access to, to economic opportunity. And 80% of Americans feel there's no wiggle room. And then we wonder where the mental health crisis comes from. I remember a senator once said to me when I was in Michigan, Ms. Williamson, do you have any thoughts about what we should do about the mental health crisis? And I looked at her and I said, yeah, why don't you stop driving everybody crazy? <laughs> People can't take it. People living with chronic economic anxiety all the time. So those are the kinds of things we need. We need to be like Eleanor Roosevelt who said to her husband, we need more than the amelioration of stress. We need fundamental economic reform. So, you know, I look at someone like President Biden and I think he does care about people. And he represents the kind of corporatist who does want to m make people's lives better if he can. You know, they do want to ameliorate the stress of people but they will not go any further than the point at which to go any further would undercut the financial bottom line of the donor class. And so they act like, you know, so one major party is like a nosedive. The other major party is a managed decline. So one major party is just headed straight for the iceberg, and the other major party is saying, let's go there more slowly, and we will then hit it at a better angle. <laughs> I'm saying, let's turn this ship around. And I have taken, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, really something, but we have to do this or we will be the first generation of Americans to wimp out on doing what it takes to put this country back on track what the abolitionists could do it, and the women's suffragists could do it, and the, the labor organizers could do it, and the civil rights movement could do it, but we're just, it's just too much of an inconvenience. When people say to me, oh, Marianne, I hear all this stuff, it's so traumatizing. Do you think the people who walked across the bridge at Selma were not traumatized? You think the whole thing makes you so anxious? Are you kidding? Think about what it was for the women whose crime was that they marched for women to have the right to vote and they were put in prison. And the conditions in the prison were so awful that they went on a hunger strike. And the response of the prison officials was to send men into their cells, forcing these women, uh, the, the per think of the human experience here, force these metal contraptions onto their necks and force fed them. Gee, you think they had some anxiety, do you? We have to toughen up buttercups. That's what a friend of mine said to me once when I was thinking about whether or not to run. They're going to do this, and they're going to lie about me, and they're going to be mean to me, and they're going to blah, 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 blah. And he just texted me, and it hit me like a brick to the forehead. Toughen up, buttercup. <laughs> we have got to stop it. We've got to stop over-pathologizing. You think that everybody else who saved our democracy in their time were enlightened masters? 
No, they weren't enlightened masters. They were people with limitations and victimization and wounds, just like we are. But we have to be willing to act in spite of all that. You know, one of my favorite stories about, about Lincoln is, you know, they thought the Civil War was going to last like six weeks. Both sides thought that. Nobody had any idea it was going to be this four-year war, 600,000 people dead. And uh, Lincoln's secretary took a lot of notes. And one of the well-known stories is that when his secretary would come in and tell him how many people had died in a particular battle, he would take his head in his hands and he would rock back and forth. And he was known for saying, I cannot bear it. I cannot bear it. And so we have one of two choices. Go through situations that are sometimes hard to bear now, or either we or our children or our grandchildren will be going through situations so much harder to bear than anything you and I have to contend with. And we know this. And I think we have what it takes. I know we have what it takes. Other people had to run into battle. I'm asking you, run into a voting booth. <laughs> now, at this point, you know, I suspended my campaign because it's so, it's so rigged. Uh, the system is so rigged so that you either have to have huge amounts of money, and I mean huge. Like the president's war chest is a billion dollars. So at this point, if you don't have either huge amounts of money or access to those with huge amounts of money, the system is designed that you will have no ability to be anywhere near the pinnacles of power. And then in my case, kicking me off ballots. Many of you might remember when I ran four years ago, I had a CNN town hall. I was on CNN pretty often. I was on MSNBC pretty often. This time they saw me coming. Blacklisted. It's a political media industrial complex. It's like written in the sky, no matter what you do. Don't let that woman have a viral moment. <laughs> and so what they do, and the psyops, and the smears, and the planted, you, and the infiltration. You know, I want to tell you something. When you run for president, the FBI calls you and says, we'd like you to come in, and we give this little briefing to every, every candidate. And I'm sure it's the same words they use with each of us. And they talk about what to be aware of because it will probably happen. And they say these things uh, come from their three main actors uh, that will do these things. Iran, China, Russia. And I looked at the, the FBI agent and I said, I know all of those phenomena quite well and I don't think they came from outside our shores. I mean, the system, you, you run into things that you weren't brought up to be around. But I don't see any other way to change what is than to remember, as a friend of mine said, we feel we're powerless, but we're only powerless until we pierce the illusion and remember how powerful we are. We are the people. We are the people. So I suspended my campaign because I did so poorly, if you even knew how these things work, you, you get to the point, if you're a campaign like mine, a grassroots campaign like mine, you can either, you're, you're like, do I pay to get on the ballots or do I pay for a campaign? Hundreds of thousands of dollars to get on these ballots. I, it, it's crazy. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why should it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars just to be on a ballot? But these are the way they try to go away, go away, go away, go away. And they, they do whatever they need to do, because they had, in this case, decided it's Joe Biden. Now, traditionally, the role of a political party is to stand in the background, and then the people decide who the nominee should be, and then the political party comes at this point. Now, some of us are old enough to remember Lyndon Johnson was the incumbent president, and Eugene McCarthy primaried him, and then Bobby Kennedy Sr. Nobody thought that was weird. It was called democracy. People primary sitting president, uh, sitting senators all the time. People primary sitting uh, Congress people and mayors all the time. But there was this trance that went over traditional Democrats. No, 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 no. We don't primary a sitting president. Who says? They just come up with these narratives. And this idea that, no, you can't split the vote. It's a primary. You can't split the vote in a primary. Oh, no, no, no. We have to be for Joe. 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 Finally, just even in the last few weeks, people are starting to think, 
Should we even consider the fact that he's not a strong candidate? When people have said to me over and over, Marianne, how could you do this? Don't you know that fascists are at the door? I'm doing it because there's a fascist at the door. And the only way that we are going to override that is the way Roosevelt said. Franklin Roosevelt said we would never have to worry about a fascist takeover in this country as long as democracy delivered on its promises. The problem isn't just that there's a fascist at the door. A fascist arriving at the door was almost inevitable because uh, democracy is not delivered on its promises. De de promises delivered would mean we had a thriving middle class rather than a destroyed one. It would mean we had universal health care. It would mean we had tuition-free college and tech school. Democracy hasn't been working for people, and that's why that which would assault democracy is so close. They should never have gotten so close. And so at this point, at this point, and there's no time to wait, none of this like, oh, well, we'll come back strong in 2028. Everybody here knows that if we're you not know, careful and that guy gets in, don't consider it a guarantee that we'll even have a chance in 2028. So I suspended my campaign. I suspended my campaign because, you know, on the level of the horse race, they got me. And then I realized there's so much more important going on here than the horse race. I don't need to win the, I don't need to win the nomination to make some noise. And that's why I am asking. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, uh, you know, when I was a kid, my father used to walk around the house, beat the system, kid, beat the system, kids, beat the system. I, I called my father, I mean, my brother, when I was about 50 years old, and I said, I think Daddy meant that. And he said, yeah, he meant that. And he used to also say to me, or to all of his, his kids, don't let the bastards get you down. So I suspended, and then I realized the bastards had gotten me down. And... Uh, I unsuspended my campaign. Because, you know, when you're on those ballots, those ballots are everything. You have no idea, those of you who have donated my, to my campaign, and I hope those of you who have not, or even those of you who have, will consider donating today. At, just go to Marianne2024.com. Because without the money, you don't have staff. Without the money, you can't travel. Without the money, all the things that are involved. And so at this point, it's about knowing that we are on 40 ballots. And if you get enough votes, then you get delegates. And if you get delegates, you go to the convention. And even if I do not get enough delegates to go to that convention, with every vote that I get, there is some eyebrow somewhere that is raised. And when I, when I got out of the race last time, I promised to everyone who had supported me that I would continue to do everything as possible to be as inconvenient as possible to those who so deserve to be inconvenienced. And my commitment to you today is that I will continue to do that if you help me. Let us inconvenience them together. Let us stand in our time. Let us rise in our time. Let us challenge forces of systemic injustice in our time, just like other generations have done. What are we going to get from it? We're going to be able to look in the mirror and go, yeah, we did what we could. The bastards didn't get us. And at this point, I think, particularly for those of us who are involved in spirituality and higher consciousness, you know, the next step to, is to realize it's not just about you. If I have, if I have learned anything in my life, I, I think the best piece of advice I can ever give myself in any situation that is challenging to me is, oh, Marianne, get over yourself. We desperately need to get over ourselves. We desperately need to realize that this whole idea of a society that works for everyone that it's not just about that I have this right or we have these rights, we have these rights. It also means we have profound responsibilities. So we need to clean up the past through things such as reparations for slavery in order to move forward. We need a ceasefire now. There are extremely important things that we need to do now. We need to learn to wage peace. We need an economic bill of rights. None of that will happen unless the people demand it. But according to the Declaration of Independence, we not only have that right, we have that responsibility. I have uh, a little personal motto that uh, works for me, and maybe it will be of use and of value to you. Some of you, you'll have come up with different words, but I have come to understand that there are a lot of hours in the day, many aspects of ourselves, 
there is personal change that is necessary, and there is external society change that is necessary. It's a big both and. So the one that works for me and that I offer you in case it's helpful, pray in the morning, kick ass in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.